Good morning and welcome to Overcome Out Loud with Charlie Smith. This podcast is dedicated to speaking with real people that have uh, faced real obstacles and how they've overcome them. And this morning, we're actually here live in Westlake with a really dear friend, uh, Lacey Calhoun. Lacey, good morning. Welcome to Overcome Out Loud, my friend. Good morning. Thank you for having me. I have been so excited about having you on. It has been incredible to watch your growth and see the courage and the vulnerability that you express and experience and help other people experience um and i just want to thank you for for coming in and and sharing this morning it is like i said just a a privilege to have you on awesome it's it's good to be here i'm already feeling emotional you're already moving me to tears and we've just begun i know i knew this would i'm a crier i know so am i (laughs) I tell people sometimes when i have guests on to take out a pen and pad to take some notes because they're going to learn some things and this way you you, this one you may want to pad and some tissue okay just so you know yeah because we're uh (laughs) we're we're two emotional people that have been on an emotional journey and, and watching Lacey over the last year of her life has been inspiring to say the very least uh, mm-hmm. because you exemplify a courage, a vulnerability, and a passion um, and have found your purpose and it's been inspiring. And I think bef- before we can ever get there, we have to talk about what it took to find that and, 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 and it hasn't been easy for you, you know, and I really want to understand a little more about what people experience early on in their life and then where they ended up and how they got out because I think part of Overcome Out Loud is the opportunity to give people hope and that no matter what you're dealing with, you know, no matter what you're in recovery from or what you're suffering from, if you're suffering in silence, the reason that people like Lacey and myself Overcome Out Loud is to give you hope. And so tell us a little bit, Lacey, about the beginning for you. Where'd you grow up? How did you grow up? And and, and what was that like for you as a young kid? Yeah, I grew up out here, actually. I grew up in Oak Park. Um, in Agora Hills. It was before Agora. Oak Park didn't exist. It was Agora first, and then they kind of split it off into two, and then it became Oak Park. So I'm kind of both. I'm OG both. Um, And I was born into, straight into chaos and dysfunction. I think that's a lot of our stories here. Um, You know, my mom, she... then, back then, they didn't know what postpartum was. And she had suffered from severe postpartum from having my brother, and then two years later, you know, and wasn't treated for that, and then two years later, she had me. And she had her own history of stuff going on. So when I came along, um, she was just in a very broken space. And, you know, I, I suffered the consequences of that from the day I was born. And... Um, I was raised by my mom and my dad, um, predominantly my dad in the first part of my life because mom was kind of off finding herself and doing her thing. Um, and my my aunt, my aunt up in Sacramento, um, she stepped in a lot. She flew down a lot to help take care of me and my brother and my grandma who um, was like a mother to me. She lived in Malibu. She, she helped raise me too. Um, but there was a lot of confusion just straight out of the gates, there was just a lot of confusion about the family dynamic, who got along with who, who was suffering from what, and nothing was ever explained to me. I was just kind of tossed around. Um, My dad had remarried, and um, that was a very dysfunctional relationship. She was an addict. And it was just um, my dad, who I love, he is like the knight in He's a white knight in shining armor. You know, he has always been my savior and the most stable person in my life. Um, But he was working all the time. You know, he was building his business. So we were left to be with my stepmom most of the time. And it just wasn't a very stable situation. So when I, yeah, and and, and when I hear that, I, you know, when you say I, I had to deal with the consequences of that very early on, really right from the beginning, uh, I know for me, having grown up in, in a very, uh, violent and chaotic and tumultuous home, you know, that those consequences took on a lot of different forms. You know, for you, obviously, when we've got a, a, a mother who is not attending to or caring or loving unconditionally her daughter, I mean, it, it must have had, when you say those consequences, it was, uh, you know, kind of a feeling, it sounds like you had a f- feeling of just being lost. I was lost, yeah. for sure. And I was just very unsure. From a very young age, I just started to kind of come out of myself just to kind of get by and survive. You know, I 
you know, I'm 36 years old today and I'm just now learning how to be in my body and to be present. And even before drugs and alcohol hit the scene, I was already numbing out in other ways. I was already escaping in other ways, you know. Um, I, I got lost in reading very early on and that was an escape for me. Um, I had a lot of behavioral problems in terms of just like my anger and having misplaced emotion and not knowing what it was. There was no one there to explain it to me. I was given zero tools, um, you know, and I, I would lash out and it was tough. It was really confusing. I was really confused. And my mom was there, you know, she was around and she loved me. And I knew that I never didn't feel loved from my mom um, or any of the adults in my life. I never didn't feel loved. I always felt loved, but they were going through so much shit, man. And I was feeling it. I was feeling it and no one was explaining to me what was going on and nobody was getting the help that they needed. Nobody was dealing with it and coping with it in a healthy way. So obviously they didn't have the tools. They couldn't teach me. They couldn't give me those tools. And so there it began. Such the, the cycle right, continues, such right? Such the right perspective. And what a what a great perspective to have 36-year-old Lacey look back and, and give young Lacey some perspective on what it was because at the time, you know, and I think people confuse, you know, our, our, our self-awareness at the age of 36 or 42 with what we were going through as a child because you couldn't verbalize what you just said when you were six, seven, eight years old. All Absolutely you knew not. is that the, the home you were in was chaotic, that you didn't know where you fit in. And so you looked for, you said, you started numbing up, you looked for these escapes. And I, I often talk about the creation of this false self and how those dysregulated, dysfunctional families create this sense of, of uncertainty in us. And so being us can't be okay. We don't even know who we are. So we start to create these other versions of ourselves and we start to attach to this this false self. And you found that in, in a lot of different unhealthy behaviors long before you found drugs or alcohol. Absolutely. And you know, when um, middle school kind of hit, <sighs> have you ever seen the movie Mean Girls? <laughs> I have. I was a mean girl, you know, and that was another way that I was acting out is all this chaos and stuff was going on in my own life and in my own home. And I basically went to school and just kind of took it out on everybody else. And I didn't know that that's what I was doing at the time, obviously. Of course. You know, I was just yeah taking the chaos from home and coming to school and creating more chaos and just roping everybody into it. And I didn't learn until now, into my mid-30s, that, you know, I was resentful of certain people for, like, the relationship that they had with their mom or, like, the stability that they had in their home. And then I would, like, punish them for it, you know? It I was. Do. It was, it's crazy to look back on it and have the clarity on it now. I wish I could like go apologize to so many people. <laughs> There's so many people that I, I would like to give a face-to-face -face apology to for that. Um, but it's impossible. Well, this is, <laughs> this is your opportunity. This is, this is all of our opportunity to heal. And I, you know, I've changed the narrative myself and what I hear from you is, is a very changed narrative from, you know, what was wrong with you to what had happened to you. And so I don't think people, you know, for me, I always describe school as a minefield. It wasn't like I could take, you know, and somehow say, okay, the parents that are in this house in Scarborough, Maine are unsafe and violent and chaotic. But when I go to school, these people are safe. You know, it, everybody's the same to you. You see these through a terror set of glasses. You know, it's like you have a set of glasses on that you grow up with. And it's not like you take them off when you go to school. Those glasses are still on. So all of those kids you're seeing through your glasses that were put on you at a young age at home. And so what do you do? You lash out. You know, for me, it was it was kind of chameleon. It was fit in. It was people pleasing. It was more kind of fear and anxiety and worry. So I, I got, you know, attention in unhealthy ways. And for you, it was, you know, lashing out and in, in, in sharing your own anger and, and exposing everyone else to the pain that you were in through anger. I mean, it's just what you learned. And a lot of it was control. A yeah. lot of it was control for me. Tell me about that. Just like from very early on, I just wanted to control everything and everybody around me. So that, you didn't have any control at home. There was no control. And so that's where I did it. That's where I got my control, you know? And I, I quickly learned that I could like move the pawns of the game myself and I could get people to do what I wanted them to do by manipulation, you know? And um, 
what's the word I'm looking for? <sighs> kind of like scare tactics almost. Yeah, yeah you absolutely, know? of course. So that's just, that's how I've lived for a very long time. Until I got sober at 34 years old, that is how I lived and dealt with so many of my relationships. I, I tell people all the time, and maybe you can relate to this. I say we, we do things in pattern because we get a payoff from them. And, and that includes unhealthy behaviors. I mean, you Absolutely. got a payoff from acting out and from using your anger. You, you got a payoff of having a sense of control. And even though it was through, you know, unhealthy behaviors and it was through shame and guilt and anger and manipulation uh, and control you had a sense of control and that's what you were craving you weren't getting it at home and so you developed a pattern of doing that and and until you learned another way to do it you were gonna you were that you were gonna take you were gonna scorch the earth with that behavior yeah it was working for me right you know I got what I wanted and when did when did drugs and alcohol come into the, come on the scene for you drugs and alcohol entered the scene probably around 14 15 years old um, you know, it started you lasted with, a few more years than me. I got, I was at, tw I was you're 12. You're 12. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah a little, a, a little bit longer, you know, it started with like marijuana, smoking a little pot and then, you know, alcohol entered the scene and that was fun. Um, Did you find the escape immediate or was it more social? I think it was more social for me in the beginning, for sure. But I definitely, looking back on it in hindsight, there was definitely a level of relief there was definitely a <sighs> there was an exhale whenever I got drunk or high absolutely but it's funny because my control went into my using I I worked to control my using so I was very cognizant and aware of how much I was drinking did I seem to other people like I was too drunk am I getting sloppy here okay reel it in so even when I was high and drunk, I was controlling it, which I find so interesting. It is, and it's <laughs> it, it, again, it's like we, we develop skills, we develop coping skills, and we apply them. You know, it's like I say now, it's like if I develop discipline in any aspect of my life, I can, I can apply discipline to all aspects of my life. And if I develop unhealthy behaviors, I can, you know, I had the ability to run a business and to drink and use, and it was because I developed a work ethic when I was young to avoid being home. Didn't mean that I was a great worker, it just meant I learned a skill to work hard to avoid being at home, and I used that skill and the ability to drink and use to propel my life forward. It didn't mean I was doing it in a healthy way, it just meant that was a skill I, I learned, and so you learned control. Control for you was at any, you know, control at any cost. In my drinking, in my using, yes. in my relationships, I was gonna control, I didn't have control here, I was gonna find control everywhere else. And I think that ended up being a huge problem for me and why it took me so long to see that I had a problem because I was constantly able to validate what I was doing by saying, but I'm in control of this. I got this. I, I work. I own businesses. I later went on to have children. I own a house. You know, right. I got married. I, I, my life on paper looked good and in control. So I don't have a problem. I got this. We're good. That's so We're amazing. Good. It's it's I think it's I think it's one of the fallacies that people don't understand about the double life we lead. It's, oh, and, the and, double life. Yeah, and it's, it's like huge. We, we we look at this kind of perception of control to the outside world, but I, I always say we have two thermostats: the beliefs that we have about ourselves and our behaviors, and you know, we 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 when those are out of alignment, you know, ultimately. You know, we're good until we're not. You know, I mean, I, I ran a 35-person company and built 4 million square feet of shopping centers while chewing Vicodin and drinking and doing coke in the bathroom at business conference until I couldn't anymore. I can, you know? re I can relate. Right? The, the double life is paid. scary. And, you know, I find myself, I'm still reconciling that, Yeah. by the way. Tell me about that. It's interesting because when I first got sober and people in my life heard what I was doing, a lot of people were like, really? Yes. You have a problem? Right. I don't think you have a problem, you know? I do. And a lot of those people, you know, perhaps it held up a mirror to their own using, and especially if they were people that I was partying with on a regular basis, or, you know, they just didn't see me all the time, and they saw me on social media or once in a while, and they're like, God, you just, you seem so together. And it's like, well, that's the danger of the double life, because like what you're doing here, I was suffering silently. And I was able to manage that shit for a long time. Until I couldn't. Until you couldn't. Until I couldn't. So what happened? I mean, tell me a little bit about what led up to, you know, I think um, 
all of us have that bottom. You know, I mean, I think, you know, I, I believe we don't have, you know, I, I think one of the messages I, I, I really want to share with people is you don't have to get any sicker to get better. You can turn this ship around at any point, but this happens to be one disease that does require us to hit a bottom of some sort. Some lose more than others. Um, you know, what led up to, what led up to you realizing that, that something had to change? We're, yeah, I have what you, we call a high bottom. You know, I, I didn't get arrested. I didn't hurt anybody. I didn't hurt myself. I didn't financially fall into ruins. Um, so again, that was another thing that was against me. That was another obstacle through finding that I had a problem. Um, but, you know, I partied, man. I partied and I've had some good times. I partied throughout my 20s hard. And it wasn't, I wasn't, um, how old was I? I was like 19 when cocaine first entered the scene. And from uh, that very... We have another frustrated chemist. Yeah. That very <laughs> first line, that was it. I was in. I was in. And, you know, I went on a tear. A tear. And, but I hit it. I hit it so well. I hit it so well. And I still did all the things that I needed to do. You know, I was going to school and then I got a job. So no one really knew the, the wiser. Um, you know, I was what we call like a weekend warrior. Sure. <laughs> Go hard on the weekends. Monday came and I was like duh, 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 showing up. So again, I had it in control. And then when I was about 22, um, I overdosed. And I was alone. Nobody was with me when it happened. I, I got myself to a hospital. Um, I, I remember going into the emergency waiting room and they were, it was like code red. I mean, there were p tons of people waiting in the waiting room to be seen, but they took one look at me and it was like the stretcher was out. They had me back there and it was terrifying. I was so scared. I, this was it. I was going to die. And I stayed all day in the hospital and the doctor came and spoke to me and had a heart to heart with me. It was just like, you were close. Like that was, that was really scary. And it scared the shit out of me. And so I walked out of there saying, I'll never do that again. I'm never going to do drugs again. And you meant it, by the way. I meant it. In case it. anybody's wondering, she that, that that was not a story Lacey told herself. She walked out of that hospital like many of us do, and you meant that. I meant it. And guess what? I didn't pick up drugs again for 11 years. That's right. 11 years. So here I am. I'm back in control. I'm in the driver's seat. I don't have a problem. It's just, it was a fluke. I did a little too much one time, you know? And now I know. I'm not, I'm not going to do it again. So... I went on and, you know, alcohol was still a huge part of my life. So, but it, that wasn't the problem. It was the cocaine that was the problem, not the drinking. So we're good. We're just going to go back to the, the basics. And I went on for 11 years and, and um, I did a lot in those 11 years. A lot of things that I'm proud of, a lot of things I'm not so proud of. And um, I, I got pregnant. Surprise pregnancy. It was not a planned pregnancy. I was living in New York City. And I was used to drinking seven nights a week. I had a job where we drank socially for a living. Which was? It was I was working for um, a, a huge investor in New York City, and he owned a lot of nightlife restaurants and clubs. Oh yeah, sure. And so we had fun. We went on trips, and you know, in New York, you're drinking till four a.m. So I was used to drinking till 4 a.m. and getting up at 7 o'clock in the morning and going back to the office and then doing the whole thing all over again. So when I got pregnant and had to abruptly stop that, it was tough. And I went into a huge depress depression because nobody in my life was pregnant or having kids. Everybody was still on their career paths and still living the high life. So I was isolated so suddenly. Everyone stopped calling and coming around. I was gaining weight, <laughs> eating my way through New York City. I went on a food tour of New York City. I moved up to the Upper East Side where people raise families. And I'm like, OK, we're going to do this. I'm going to do this. And um, and then I had her. And then Lily was born, my my saving grace, my angel. You she know? is. She's an angel. And she saved my life in a lot of ways, but not yet. Yeah. I wish I could say the day she was born changed everything. And that's just not my story. It's it, just not. It just made you a mother. It just made me a mother. And guess what? There's no there's no book for that. Unfortunately, there's no manual. There's no manual on how to be a mom. So you're in New York City? In New York Single City. Single mom? No, I, w I was with her father. Oh, you were with? Okay. Yeah, she has an amazing father. And um, I was like, I it's time to get back to California. 
I, it was time. So I, we invested in a bar, <laughs> of all things. <laughs> sure, of course you did. To bring us back to Los Angeles and to be near my family to help with the baby. And life kept going. We opened up a bar. It's still open today. And we bought a house out here in Westlake. And um, fairy tale. Fairy tale. Yeah. Kind, oh, kind of. Kind of. <laughs> kind of. Yeah. You know, I went from living like the city high life to all of a sudden suburban mom life. And it was jarring to say the least. But I wasn't using a lot at that time. Again, I'm in control. I got this. See, I can stop at any time. This isn't a problem. And later on, I had another child by choice. Not, this one was not a surprise. <laughs> and um, a couple years later, um, I got divorced. And that was where the road to rock bottom began. Because I all of a sudden had a freedom where I had time off without children. And every time I had the time off without children, I was choosing it to spend the way I used to spend my life. Would you view it as destructive? Would you view it as reckless? Would you view it as irresponsible? Or would you view it as as as, as, as something else? At first, I thought I deserved it. Okay. It's like I a like break. That. Yeah, the entitlement. You think you deserve it. It's like, oh, good. They're there. They're with their dad. They're in a good place. I'm going to go let loose. Yeah, not I deserve a good book or I deserve a, a coffee bath. with a good friend. Right? Uh -huh. I deserve to get, get, get I get deserved to get shit-faced, yeah. you know, and make know. poor decisions. Yeah. And that became the pattern. So I, you know, one of the things that I really, at least for me, that I really dig into and for myself and for you, where was your self worth? You know, how how did you value yourself at this point? I mean, were you, were you this double life? Was there a Lacey that you wanted everyone to see, but were you still fighting that image of a of a child who really didn't feel like she fit in or didn't feel like she had control? Absolutely. Yeah, I think not I, on a conscious level. No, of course, but I think that's the the one thing that I really emphasize and, and I really want people to understand is how important self-image is and and that you, you you know you really will ultimately perform at the image that you carry for yourself you know I think that's why a lot of lottery winners go broken in, in such a short period of time if you're bad with money and you win the lottery you're still going to be bad with money unless you change and so your view of yourself you know really hadn't at a, at a subconscious level you still didn't have that really grounded sense of self-worth and so for you the behaviors went along with that image of you, not what you wanted us to see, because in the, you wanted us to see Westlake and successful and good mom and all the things that right. we want people to see. But inside, it was you, you didn't feel like you really deserved that reputation, did you? No, yeah. and it it was skewed too because you're bouncing back and forth between these lives. It's the whole back to the double life. It is a it is a lonely, lonely place, you know. Because I I don't even know who I am, you know. As soon as my kids leave, I'm this person. And as soon as they get back, I'm this person. Who am I? So the I, so so I, you you describe so perfectly what 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 I what I want people to understand about these these pitfalls of isolation. It's like even around people, you just don't feel like you're with people. You you really are just surviving and bouncing from life to life, existing. Absolutely. Yeah, amazing. It's it's a scary place to be for sure, but it 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 worked for a long time. It did. I was able to keep it up for a long time. And it wasn't until two years after the divorce that I got sober. So I went on, I went down that path for two years. And it, you know, like we know, it gets worse, never better. And it, it got to the point where I was no longer waiting for them to leave. I was drinking when they were home. And I was drinking as soon as five o'clock hit. Well, that's when everyone drinks, right? It's five o'clock. You're, it's safe to pour this glass of wine. So I was getting some alcohol in me before they went to bed. And then it got to the point where I could not wait for them to go to bed. Just get in bed and go to sleep so that I can have my me time that I deserve. And you again, know? not a bath and a book. and No, it's the rest of the bottle and open another one and have a friend come over while my kids are asleep. And let's go sit in the backyard and let's smoke a joint and let's open another bottle. And let's do that every single night. You know, it was, it just progressed. It got worse and worse and worse and worse. And those were the people I chose to hang around. I had a whole gang of friends who are incredible, sober, beautiful mothers. And I started to isolate myself from them. Of course. They were not the ones that I wanted to be hanging around because they weren't doing the things I wanted to be doing. You know? I do. I, I, jo I joined a country club when I was uh, a young executive. And lots of guys played golf and went home to have dinner with their families. You know, and I found the guys that did coke in the bathroom and, and, oh, yeah. and, and took and took pills you know, out of each other's lockers and stayed up all night playing cards because they made me feel like 
my life wasn't that bad. Like I was just doing what everyone does, but but I couldn't see what everyone that really sh- shared different values than I had were really just playing golf and going home. Yeah. So that that lower companion kind of uh huh rings true for me. S- lower so companion, much. I love that. Yeah. That's definitely what it is. And I love those people, and I don't want those people to like hear the words that I'm saying and and think that I think ill upon them or oh, no, look yeah, down sure. upon them. You Absolutely know, there's right. not like an all high mighty thing that comes along with that. I am now clean and sober, and you're not. Um, you know, just don't choose to live that way anymore. I just don't choose to live that way yeah. anymore. So, what was the catalyst? So, the 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 progression is occurring, and and all of us obviously reach that jumping off point where we where we've got to make a change and. What was that? What was that for you? What was the catalyst? I mean, like a lot of people want to want to know that because they, you know, you always get the questions. Non-alcoholics, non-addicts, non-trouble, not people without a problem, really never ask. It's like I was reading a book by by Chuck C called The New Pair of Glasses, and he says there's lots of tests for substance abuse, you know, um, but he says the best one is I've never heard one non-alcoholic wonder if they're an alcoholic. He says, if you're a non-alcoholic, you usually don't wonder if you're an alcoholic. Totally. Yeah. And I never, I don't know, I just, I have alcoholism in my family and I have a lot of people in my family who have gotten sober before me and I kind of always ragged on them. Sure. You know, just like, oh, they drink the Kool-Aid, they're going to this AA thing, like, get, uh, give me a break. Like, these were people I was doing drugs with, you know, like, I just ragged on them for so long that I felt like I had to keep up with that, you know, I couldn't go back on my word and be like well maybe me too oh no way no so i i didn't have a problem i'm going to show you what it's like to be able to have fun and live life and have your life together and still be able to have an occasional drink but to answer your question i think the catalyst was um like i said i went 11 years without the drugs and i found myself in a situation where the drugs came back into my life and I, I had said that weekend, I knew I was going to be around it that weekend, and I had gone 11 years. I was like, I'm not going to break. There's no way I'm going to break. I've been doing this for a long time. This is easy peasy, you know? And I broke. I saw it. I got drunk enough, and I was like, give me that. Just one. And there was a little pushback from the person I was with because he knew. He knew what had known my story. It did not take much convincing. I mean, who doesn't want someone to jump on with them and have a night of fun? Right. And that was it. That was it. My old friend was back. And I loved it. I loved it. Tiger was out of the cage. Yeah. And it felt good. And there was a little bit of shame and guilt. Like, I'm a mother now. This is not what I should be doing. What What if something should happen to me? And this is the story my kids have to tell. Mom died from drugs. You know, a little bit of that would come in. But... Not enough to stop. Not enough to stop. And then every time I did it, the next day, I said, I'm never doing it again. And then the next weekend would come, and I was doing it again. And enough of that happened. And then there was one day where I chose to do it at a party, a family gathering, where my children were. And I was sneaking out to the car to do bumps of cocaine throughout the entire day. And later that night, my daughter, my oldest daughter, she was she's such a snuggle bunny. She's just a love mush. She's the best. She wouldn't come near me. Like she sensed something. And she wouldn't come home with me. She's like, I'm going to Mimi's. I'm going home with Mimi. And she went home with my mom. And I drove my youngest daughter home. And when I got home, I sat on the couch. And I was like, holy crap. I have been doing drugs all day and I just drove my child home and I was like never again like this is it and I wish I could say that was the last time I did it and it wasn't the following weekend I was doing it again and I was lying about it to people who I was doing it with you know when you're lying to people you're doing it with who are also doing it you have a problem we've reached another low I'm lying about the amount I have I'm you know I'm squirreling it for myself I'm hiding it in places in my house and I was like I was gone I had reached the point of no return and I at that point I was scared I was scared and I had a psychiatrist appointment that week a couple days later I don't really remember what happened in that appointment I can't tell you there was no like aha moment but she looked at me and she said you know 
and I wasn't there spilling my guts. She didn't know what I was up to. Yeah, we lied. We lied to those therapists oh, pretty good. Yeah, really well. And um, she said, you know, I think I think you're ready for um, a little more help, like a deeper experience than what I can give you and what your therapist can give you. I have this really great place and she took out a post-it and she wrote out a name and a number and she handed it to me. She's like, why don't you just give him a call? And I was like, okay, yeah, didn't really think much about it. But when I got in the car and I sat in the car, I took the post-it out and something greater than myself took over my body and I called that number right then and there in the parking lot. And they spoke to me for five minutes they took my health insurance phone number my health insurance information we'll call you back in five minutes they called me back you are covered why don't you come in tomorrow and talk to us I went in the next day I called my parents and I said I'm going to this place um they're going to help me with my mental health I'm still not admitting that I have a drug and alcohol problem I am going for mental health I'm going for my depression and my anxiety and everything that I'm feeling as a consequence of my drinking but it is not the drinking and the using. And I started that Monday. And I had one last hurrah that weekend. I knew I was going in and I got smashed and I had my kids with me and I had to call a friend and Uber them to where I was so they could drive my car home so I wasn't driving my kids home. And I went into treatment Monday morning. Wow. Yeah. Well, I can tell you that having, having, I mean, our stories are actually so similar because I remember in February of 2000, in, in January of 2007, I, I, New Year's Eve, I drove my kids in, in my car loaded and, and, you know, swore off drugs and alcohol. And, and I only lasted about 45 days before I, you know, and I don't, I don't think I was actually sober during that period of time, but I did reduce the amount of prescription drugs I was consuming and really tried to straighten up. And, and, and after 45 days, you know, I, I, I literally ended up in a therapist's office and walked out of there and made it made the exact same kind of change that you did. And I just, you know, it's like you could pass the bank account test, you could pass the house test, you could pass the mom with two kids test, but you couldn't pass the look in the mirror test, huh? No, no, I could not. And it's so funny when I think back to I, I fought that treatment center to the nail on my drug and alcohol problem. It took me a month, one month of being there to agree to go to AA and to just listen. And I will never forget this day because I was like, I am not an alcoholic. I am not an addict. And I was sitting in my counselor's office, who you know too, Mindy Johnson. Oh, yeah. Huh, world's best. Yes. She saved my life. God bless her. She asked me to take out a pen and paper. And she said, we're going to do a little exercise. And she was very nonchalant about it. And I was like, cool. And... um. She said, I want you to write down 10 consequences of your drinking. Just 10 consequences you've ever experienced from drinking too much. I was like, okay, no problem. Two minutes, 10 consequences, easy. And I was like, all right, done. You know, a little chip on my shoulder. Did the assignment, now what? And she said, a normal drinker can't even make this list. A normal drinker would experience one, maybe two of these things, and they would never do it again. They would never drink that much again. And I was like, Whew. that was it. The truth was in your, the truth was in your face. There was Undeniable. no escaping it. Yeah. I had written it down myself. This is what I've done. And I was just like, whoa. And that was it for me. And I was like, okay, I'm listening. I'm listening. And uh, you know, having witnessed. Uh, really firsthand in a lot of ways your your journey um early sobriety is not 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 easy it's no. you know it's it, is it worth it yes but you've you've you know i've been very um transparent about you know the pain that goes along with the realization of the life you were living all of the work that it takes to deal with that and then and then living the life you have now i mean i'm sitting in front of one of the most confident vulnerable you know inspirational people that 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 i come across i mean i really have a deep 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 amount of respect and and, and admiration for you um you. and and hearing how how dark it got i think is really going to help other women understand that there is a way out you know and and if you were to if you were to kind of speak to them you know on on overcome out loud and say you know what i can tell you is to start your journey out the most important thing is what connection yeah connection to other women specifically 
we love you men. Yes, we love you men in recovery. You know, but um, but your sobriety sisters are your. They mean a lot to you. They, I, without them, I I couldn't do it. I couldn't, and I I never had that before. You know, I just had such dysfunctional relationship with with relationships with women, my whole life, and the the women in recovery have written a different story for that for me and I'm forever indebted to them. I can call any of them at any given time and they would be here in 5 seconds to pick me up. Well, and and you have because this you know as I, as I know and I think you know you've shared openly about some of the the pain that you've experienced in sobriety. I mean, sobriety is not um, you know, the path of of roses and waterfalls. I mean, life still happens in sobriety and I think people somehow confuse sobriety with not feeling things and it's just quite the opposite it's 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 feeling everything and and not being able to numb it out and i think that's i think one of the things i've admired most about you is how open you are about the feelings and about the deep amount of pain that you've been in in sobriety and how and i have watched you and correct me if i'm wrong but i have watched you holding on by a thread to the life that you have today knowing that you know whether it's the loss that you've suffered of your your dear friends uh, daughter your family close friends daughter um, or other things that you've dealt with in in sobriety and I've I've seen those sisters sitting in your house with you I've heard you know those calls that you've made you know to just help you hold on for one more day because it's it's it seemed even in sobriety even with abstinence it seemed dark and it seemed hopeless but it wasn't because you had another you had another lever to pull. You know, it wasn't the, the coke or the, the alcohol. It was a friend. Yes, it was the connection. It was the other people who have walked the path before me. And all I have to do, which I could never do before, was just shut up and listen. Just shut up and listen. Listen to what they tell me to do and then just do it. When I don't know what to do for myself, they know exactly what I need to do and that's just what I need to do. And, you know... I. I have this platform now where so many women reach out to me and and they want to get sober. They want to stop drinking. They want to stop using. And the main thing I hear from all of them is, but I don't know how. I don't have anybody in my life who's doing this. And it's so rewarding to connect them to this community. It's like, have no fear, my friend. I have the best place for you. And you are welcome to come as you are who you are, with everything that goes along with that. And we are here. And we are going to hold you up until you can hold yourself up. Listen, man, you can learn something from this. I mean, this is, and, and, and I've watched it. I've watched it change your life, and I've watched you reach out and change the lives of, of other women. And, and we did suffer in silence, but how powerful is it to overcome out loud? How powerful is it to watch these other women feel a sense of hope? I mean, it's hope, right? It's hope. It's hope. Um, it's, it's the true meaning and purpose of life, which is so funny because that's what I was always searching for all along. You know, that was it. This was it. This is what was always missing. I knew that this was missing, but I didn't know how to get there. And it's just really powerful stuff, but life still happens. And we do have to live life on life's terms. And, and I think that's why so many of us drink and use is because we don't know how to live life on life's terms. We do not have the tools to experience trauma and pain and loss and grief and anxiety and depression. We don't have those tools. We're, they're not, we're not taught that at school. There needs to be a whole class. Remember they back in the day, your time, I think they did home ec. Yeah, home ec. Home ec. <laughs> home you ec. know, teaching women how to sew and how to cook. Like, uh, let's teach us how to deal with our shit. Yeah, we we need less of the opium wars, the Turkish and the you know the Turkish opium wars, and more emotional intelligence because, I, and I think kids are facing high levels of anxiety and depression now. I, I was reading recently that that colleges, even before COVID, are experiencing. Um, and a, a massive amount of leaves of absence from college, more so than they've ever experienced before in, in the collegiate environment, just because kids are so unprepared to deal with kind of the emotional triggers that are occurring in their lives today. And so they're needing to, they, they need to escape already. And so I, I couldn't agree with you more. And, and I'm just, uh, you know, now I, now I love this part of the story because, you know, 
you're on a mission. I mean, yeah. you, 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 you've started um, and found, as you said, your, your passion. Um, tell us about your essential oils. Tell us about surface and soul. Tell us about how you're connecting women to themselves and to their own stories and to their own lives in such an amazing way. Because, uh, you know, look, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not part of your female community, but I am inspired by you. And I want, I want people to learn more about what it is you're doing and, and how that's available to anybody. You know, find your passion, find your purpose, and, and to start out and, and to watch what you've grown is, is remarkable. So tell us about it. Yeah, I, it's, it's just another one of those things where I was just overcome with this feeling that I needed to start sharing. When I first got clean and sober, I went off of social media for over a year. And I, I took a break from all of that because I needed to go within and I needed to fix my life. And I didn't want any outside distractions or anywhere where I might compare my journey to somebody else's journey because comparison is the theft of joy. Yes, ma'am. And social media breeds a lot of competition and a lot of comparison. And so I knew that, and I knew I needed to step outside of that. With that being said, social media can be such a powerful tool if you do it right. And when the pandemic first hit, I had just taken my one-year cake. I had just celebrated one-year sobriety. And I was like, thank God. I got sober before this happened because I swear I would be dead or institutionalized. And by the way, the, the, the group of people that stood up with you when you took your cake was amazing. Yeah. I don't think there was a dry eye in the place, my friend. (laughs) They're pretty, they're pretty amazing. I'm I'm loved. Like I said, from the beginning, I've always felt loved. Yeah. So, but I think the, the, and and I don't want to deemphasize this, but I think what I see is someone who actually loves themselves and it doesn't matter how many other people love us until we love ourselves and pass that mirror test. It's all empty. And I see someone who really loves herself. I do now. Yeah. I can say that now. Yeah. With confidence for sure. And that feels good. You know, it's good for me and it's good for my kids to see that because they've seen both sides of the coin, right? Yeah. They've seen a mom who didn't really love herself so much and now they've seen a mom. And while they can't articulate the difference, they feel it. They feel it. Just like they felt that day something was off, they feel something's on. They see who's around you. They see how you're communicating with them. They see how you're reacting, how you've held them up during this the, the loss of their deal. I mean, you're the example that they that they need. There was such a huge shift in their behavior when I first got sober, within months, that that was another aha moment for me. I thought I was fooling everybody. I thought I was fooling everybody. And to see my kids relaxed in the home, I could literally see their little nervous systems exhale. And I was like, holy crap, they knew. They didn't know no, but they knew something and they felt it and they were suffering the consequences just as I had done as a child of their surroundings and the people and the adults around them. And I never wanted to do that to them. And I had done that to them too. And it was both shameful in the same moment as it was empowering. Because there was a lot of shame to know that I had done that and put them through the same experience that I had experienced as a child. But also empowering to know we just broke the cycle. This ends now. It ends. Like this ends today. And we're going we're gonna to change the script and we're going to do this differently from moving forward. And there's a lot of power in that. I love hearing about how your kids have healed. And, you know, I, I shared a little bit about how my mother and I healed our relationship through her own kind of validation of some of the things that occurred in our family. And it was a, 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 an empowering and, and really important part of our relationship. And I love hearing about how your kids have healed. Tell me a little bit about how you and your mom have have healed as a result of your recovery. Yeah, so that is emotional. (laughs) For so much of my life, I blamed my mom. She was the reason why. And it was easy to fall victim, right? Yeah. And to pull that victim card whenever I needed to and um, and outlash at her and be angry with her and blame her. And one of the most beautiful parts about 
my time in treatment was we had an exercise that we had to do and it was a trauma outline. And if you've never done a trauma outline, it can be very powerful. I suggest doing it with a healthcare provider. <laughs> Don't go sit in your living room and do this, but warning, warning. Yeah, warning. Um, but we had to do an outline from age zero, from birth up until present time, and all the traumatic big events that have happened in your life, milestones, both negative and positive, which was really cool. So it was this line down the center of the sheet. And on the bottom in the timeline, you wrote the positive big things that had happened to you. And then above you wrote the negative things. And I, being zero, being just born, only know what I've heard. And that's so convoluted in the family. And it's not everyone has the same story and the same experience. So I, I didn't really know. And I knew that I was just going to have to go to my mom and like have the conversation. What was it really like? Because we had never had that conversation. And so I asked her to come over one night. And it was probably the most vulnerable we've ever been with each other. And I remember thinking before I asked her, she's not going to be that honest with me. I, I'm not, I'm still not going to get the answers I'm looking for. And I went, went into it with very low expectations. And what ended up happening was we had a very open and honest conversation. And she showed up as the most brave and courageous and vulnerable woman I had ever seen. And she was honest. And she said some really hard things that might be hard to say to your kid. You know, yeah, when you were born, I had a hard time. I didn't give you a bottle. I didn't change your diaper. I wasn't there for those things. And you would think that would be difficult to hear, but it was so healing to hear her say it out loud. What I had felt and could never articulate or truly know, there was an answer all of a sudden. And I wasn't mad at her. There was no anger that came along. That blame all of a sudden dissipated. And I saw her not just as my mom in that moment. I saw her as a human being. And I got to hear what it was like for her. And she went into detail what her life was like and what her circumstances were like and where her, what her lack of support looked like. And I felt for her as like human to human. Like, wow, mom, that must have been really, really, really hard for you. And I just gained a whole new respect for her, a whole new respect. She was doing the best she could with the tools that she had at that time. It wasn't her fault. It wasn't her fault. I had been wrong the whole time. And it was just such a relief to me. And her and I have a beautiful relationship now. We really do. That's remarkable and, and, and so important to, because I think – I think one of the serious obstacles to overcoming anything is a victim mentality. I think the longer we stay victims of our lives and blame others, in, instead of taking responsibility for our lives, the harder it is to overcome anything. And the gift your mother gave you, and I think that this is very similar to my own healing and, and the relationship I have with my mom, is you had empathy and compassion for what she'd been through, but it was really ignited by the fact that she took responsibility for her, her role and what she didn't do. When my mother said, you know, it was my job to protect you, it was my job to give you a safe home to grow up in, and I didn't do that, and that's my responsibility, and I failed you. Um, like you said, I didn't, I didn't, it wasn't anger I felt towards my mom, but, but it was a sense of validation that I'd always been looking for that I finally had, and I could, and it was really an important part of our healing. So I'm so glad um, that you and your mom have that relationship you have now, and, and obviously you're not, a, you're not a victim of your past life, and, and she's empowered you with the validation of her own life, and, and for that, I think there's a, a big lesson for all of us. Huge. Yeah. And it's cool to see her be a grandma to my kids now. She always tells me that they're my do-over. Yeah. She said, I get to do it right now. Oh. And it's cool seeing her do it right, you know? She's the best grandma on the planet. You guys are all so lucky. I am so glad that uh, that we focused on that. It's a really important of, of healing, an important part of, of overcoming anything in our lives is, is taking responsibility and, and kind of you know, chopping up the victim card and, and putting it in the trash. Absolutely. Yeah, awesome. Cool. 
experience. And by the way, I was on recovery today, and the guy that was uh, the host of the podcast uh, really, really dug into the fact that we are some badass motherfuckers. You know? Oh yeah. I mean, we have we have the you know we don't lack perspective on on life, and and you know you are an example of one. I mean, my friend Mike Diamond calls them conscious outlaws. Man, you are a conscious outlaw. You are uh, an inspiration. And can you? Uh, let people know how they can follow you. I know I follow you. I, I know you've got a, an active platform. I know you're helping mothers and women um, with your, not just your products, but your message. And, and so we'll, we'll obviously tag all of your platforms, but just share how people can follow you and, and hear your message, Lacey. Yeah, I know. We got off. We got we we went a little bit off because you had asked that question, how I even started Surface and Soul. And I know we went down another hole. <laughs> yeah, no, we, let's let's get back to it. Though, um, it's important. But I think it is important because the pandemic hit and I mean, we all lost a sense of ourself, right? And our sense of security in this world, what was going on, where we belonged, who we were in it, what we were going to do moving forward. So many of us lost our jobs. I was one of them. I went from being okay to losing my income completely. Um, my ex-husband, who I love and adore, he's one of my best friends, um, he also lost a lot of his income, so therefore my child support kind of went out the door also, and I was at zero. But because of recovery and because of what I've learned here about you are where your feet are, one day at a time, I did not let myself future trip. I did not let myself panic about what tomorrow was going to bring. I just needed to do the next right thing. Every time I woke up, I just needed to do the next right thing. And a month into the pandemic, um, my best friend, Ashley, who's like my sister, we've been best friends for 25 years, um, her three-year-old daughter was diagnosed with a brain tumor, with DIPG. And it's a very rare type of brain tumor, and um, there's no treatment for it. And that was jarring, to say the least. We knew something was going on with her. We did not expect it to be of that big of a thing. And along with that bad news came even worse news that there was nothing that they could do about it and that we didn't have much time. And so we decided to bring her home and make her comfortable. And I'm very blessed and fortunate that we live one block away from each other. Oh my God. She helped me find my house. So I could literally walk to her house in 45 seconds. And we immediately, we had been quarantined away from each other. We immediately brought our families together and we were together every single day. And from the day we brought her home to the day that she passed was six weeks total. And that changed me in a lot of ways that that elevated my recovery in a lot of ways because i think when we first get sober we tell ourselves there's always going to be something that will happen that will excuse us to be able to use like something trapdoor something bad enough will happen that no one will blame me if i if i had a drink you know or to, or took this pill no one would blame me and here I was face to face with that very thing. I was losing a child that was my own. You know, I was in the room the day she was born. Um, I was in that OR room. And I was, I was right there in the room with her the day she took her very last breath. And I do not take any of that for granted. I'm so grateful that I got to be present and sober during that entire experience no matter how difficult it was. And it was hard. It was, hard. It was really hard. Um, but never once did I want to pick up. Not once. I wanted to be there every single second that I could and be there for my kids who were losing a sister, you know, and get them through that. And by the grace of God, and one day at a time, we got through that. And we're still getting through that, you know, Grief doesn't just, grief doesn't have an expiration date. It's there, it comes back in waves, and we're still, we're still riding the wave. You're building the, a grief muscle, muscle, and for and for your your children, you're show that you're showing them how to deal with grief, not avoid grief. Yeah. We're we're facing it, head on, together, 
And I, I've never once stepped outside of that and away from that. Not one time. So I did it. The one thing that I would excuse myself for, I did not pick up during. So now, I'm unstoppable. There's and unbreakable. There's nothing I can't do. Nothing. If I can get through that, guess what? So can you. So can you. Because we all have pain, right? We all have loss. Yes. We all have grief. It is possible, right? It is possible. And so much more beauty and so much more healing and so much more involvement and growth comes out of sitting in that pain. Because if you go and drink and you go and use instead, that pain is still waiting for you. You're going to sober up in the morning. The drugs are going to wear off. You're going to wake up. And guess what's still there? That pain's still there. It's still knocking on the door saying, hey, I'm still here. You, you forgot about me, but you got to deal with me. It's not going anywhere. Deal with me and the shame and guilt of avoiding dealing with me. Correct. Exactly. So now it's like, all right, here it comes. Let's, let's just get this out of the way. What do you want? <laughs> I feel like when you wake up in the morning, the world is like, look out, man. There is a lady ready to face this day. Yeah. Well, I'm not perfect. I will tell you. You know, no. there are times I want to escape. There of are course. times where I watch way too much Netflix, like way too much. But guess what? Netflix isn't going to kill me. So. No. no. And, 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 and the, the seeking and the, you, know, you talk about it, I think on your, uh, and I know you talk about it on your on your website for Surface and Soul that you do you, you are progress, not perfection. That that you Absolutely. are here to improve every day. I think one of the the two traits of of greatness that I've become very comfortable with are are that you know great leaders and great people that have developed a certain amount of resilience do two things: they give credit where credits due, and they're always looking to improve. And we don't judge; we just continue to grow and move forward. And as long as we do that, um, sober. You know, and aware and present um, that, you know, we always can live to, to have another day. And we can just deal, as you said, we can deal with the grief, the pain, but we don't have the guilt and the shame. So it's it's like there's only one arrow to deal with. I can deal with the one arrow, but I'm not taking the second arrow. You know, I'm not going to take the judgment arrow. I'm not taking the shame and the guilt arrow. I can take the pain. I can take the loss. I can take the failure. I can take all those arrows, but mm -hmm. I'm not going to add anything to them with guilt and shame of avoiding them. And that's what I've watched you do so miraculously. And, and with your essential oils and I think, you know, more so than just the actual product themselves, what you stand for, I think is, is really what has drawn, I think so many people to you because let's face it, there's lots of essential oil companies. There's lots of yeah. car battery companies, but it's, you know, people really connect emotionally to a message and what you share with the people that are engaged in your platform is a message of hope, a message of courage, a message of resilience and that you don't have to run or hide. You can you can face what's in front of you. And, and so I, what I'll say is, you know, Lacey Calhoun, thank you for overcoming out loud. You are a real gift. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I brought you some essential oils, by the way. I'm excited.